kia koutou, ka mihi nui kia koutou katoa, ko Moira Clooney toku ingoa. My name's Moira Clooney, I'm the Suicide Prevention Information Development Manager at the Mental Health Foundation of New Zealand. And thank you for coming to this, uh, this webinar for World Suicide Prevention Day. It's the 10th anniversary of World Suicide Prevention Day organised by the International Association of Suicide Prevention. And we're here at the um, University of Auckland's Medical School, the Mana Kitea Room. Um, and, and, and you, there are around three, 390 of you from around the country and around the world, um, from a range of, of different, different sectors, from health and mental health, from education, from um, community services and NGOs, and, and individuals who are bereaved by suicide. Um, and various other groups. We have two speakers with us today um, who are also here from around the world. Um, Professor Gregory Luke Larkin is the Lion Chair of Emergency Medicine at Auckland University. Prior to taking up this position at the University of Auckland in October 2011, Luke was Chief of the Section of International Emergency Medicine in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Yale University School of Medicine in the United States. And Annette Beautre, um was for 20 years Principal Investigator with the Canterbury Suicide Project at the University of Otago in Christchurch. She also worked with a longitudinal birth cohort study, the Christchurch Health and Development Study. In 2009, she took up the position of Senior Research Scientist at the Department of Emergency Medicine, Yale University School of Medicine in the States, and she's now back in the country at the University of Auckland. So um, the format that this webinar will take is that there's, there'll be a presentation followed by questions. Um, we're here from about two to three for about, about an hour in total. The um, slides for the presentation are available on the, the SPINS website. So in terms of questions, some of you have emailed those through beforehand. If you have other questions that you would like to ask that come up during the presentation, if you send those through to, um, to my email address, to moira at mentalhealth.org.nz, or through Twitter using the hashtag um, hash WSPDNZ. And if you want to refer those questions to us, use our Twitter name, which is uh, SuicideNZ. So I'd like to hand over to Annette and Luke to start the presentation. Good afternoon. We're, yeah. going, we're going to present jointly. I'm going to start by talking and then I'll hand over to Luke. So it gives me great pleasure to talk on this uh, 10th anniversary of World Suicide Prevention Day and uh, the International Association for Suicide Prevention has consistently over 10 years tried to present very positive messages about suicide prevention um, as they've done this year where the uh, slogan is strengthening protective factors and instilling hope. So we are going to talk about uh, a range of issues that are relevant to that topic, but we're going to begin by discussing the magnitude of the problem to the slides. and the problem of suicide in New Zealand. We're then going to talk about the risk and protective factors associated with suicidal behaviour at the micro, meso and macro levels, and then we're going to, do, to discuss your questions. So next slide, please. Uh, this first slide is to illustrate the magnitude of the problem of suicide. Um, it uh, shows world suicide rates, uh, the highest rates in Asia, in uh, India and China, where because of the volume of the population, they account for most of the world suicides. Uh, New Zealand has a suicide rate um, of around about 11 deaths per 100,000, placing it in the middle range. But New Zealand does have the highest suicide rates in the English-speaking world. There's large tracts of the uh, world for which we don't yet have uh, reliable suicide data. And that explains why, next slide, uh, we have an underestimate of more than a million deaths that occur worldwide every year for suicide. Suicide accounts for most violent deaths and more deaths every year than all wars and homicides combined. And using data from the World Mental Health Survey, conducted in 28 countries of which New Zealand was one, uh, we know that in any one year, 4% of the population have thoughts of suicide and 1%, that's one in every 100 people, makes a plan for suicide. 
The overall rate of suicide has generally not declined in the past decade, although we've seen declines in some age groups. So overall, looking next slide, looking at the magnitude of the problem, suicide is undercounted in the world, underrecognized as a major public health issue. Uh, suicide prevention as a consequence is underfunded and the issue is under-addressed. Suicide remains poorly understood, but preventable in many cases. Suicide is a very difficult public health problem. Next, Next slide. It, uh, suicide is one of the top 10 causes of death worldwide, and amongst young people aged 15 through to 35, suicide is one of the top three causes of death. The annual suicide rate in the world overall is around about 16 deaths per 100,000 people, and uh, around the world, suicide rates are generally three to four times higher in men than in women. Despite considerable research and new knowledge, we have made relatively little progress in developing a raft of effective interventions for suicide prevention. Um, over the same time period, however, we've actually seen reductions in cardiovascular disease, in stroke, motor vehicle crashes, HIV and AIDS, homicide and some cancers. And suicide, um, by comparison, is a much more difficult and complex problem than e these issues. Um, and next. next slide. Thank you. It's estimated that by the year 2020, depression will be the second major cause of years of potential life lost and disability adjusted life years after cardiovascular disease and as a consequence of the strong role that depression plays in the generation of suicidal behaviours, we expect and we estimate that suicides will rise to about 1.5 million deaths per annum worldwide. Next slide, I'm going to talk about suicide in New Zealand. And the essential point here is that over the last few years, the total number of suicides in New Zealand every year is of the order of 500. Um, the table on the slide, if you can see it, shows you that there are about three to four times more male than female suicide deaths. And the rates, um, the next slide shows you the uh, suicide rates by gender, males at the top, and the uh, female suicide rate by comparison is much more low and relatively stable. The male suicide rate reflects the rise, dramatic rise that we saw um, essentially in young male suicides in the late 1980s and the early 1990s and then the decline that we've seen um, over the last decade. The next slide. Uh, shows suicide as a percentage of all deaths in that age group for the year 2010, which is the year for which we have most recent data in New Zealand. And you can see that amongst young people, suicide accounts for a larger percentage of total mortality, um, and that with increasing age, suicide becomes um, less significant as a major cause of mortality as other uh, physical uh, diseases and illnesses um, take over. The next slide shows suicide death rates by five-year age group, again for the most recent year, 2010. And the reason that I've put this slide in is in the hope of correcting a common misperception, which is that suicide rates are highest amongst teenagers. This slide shows very clearly that that is not the case. Amongst young people, suicide rates are highest amongst young people aged 20 to 24. And in fact, the highest suicide rates in the year 2010 were amongst older people aged 85 and older. And this is a significant issue because with the aging of the population, the grain and the, and the demographic changes, we can expect larger numbers of um, older adult suicides in the coming years. If there is a misperception that the suicide rates are highest amongst the youth, it tends to drive advocacy for funding to be directed towards young people. Um, uh, and that's understandable because suicide is seen amongst the young is seen as more tragic. But the reality that we have to face right now, because the baby boomers are already getting older, is that we do have to begin to address older adult suicide um, in a very serious way.
The next slide shows uh, Maori and non-Maori suicide rates by gender uh, over the years from 1996 to 2010 and it shows that Maori have slightly higher suicide rates both amongst males and females. Uh, the next slide shows methods of uh, suicide deaths in New Zealand for the year 2010 and the significant fact in this slide is that the majority of suicides are by hanging which leaves relatively because the means for hanging are so widely available and ubiquitously available it leaves relatively little opportunity to intervene at the means restriction level which we know is a very effective method of suicide prevention um, and it means therefore that we have to um, focus on other approaches in New Zealand to suicide prevention taking account of implementing means restriction wherever that's possible. Uh, the next slide uh, shows that we have had a New Zealand suicide prevention strategy for a number of years and that is currently being revised with a revision to the strategy due out at the end of this year or the beginning of next year. I think it's important to note that New Zealand suicide prevent in the next in the next slide the New Zealand suicide prevention strategy has seven goals major planks of suicide prevention and the first one um, has be, has always been to promote mental health and well-being and that is highly consistent with the theme of this year's World Suicide Prevention Day. We're now going to move to talk about risk and protective factors um, and ways and approaches to instill hope about suicide prevention and this discussion uh, is going to be conducted by Professor Luke Larkin. Thank you, Annette. Kiora. Um, the next slide really is a, uh, a graphic of an ecological model developed by Annette and uh, myself that shows in uh, white, yellow, and orange colors sort of the micro, meso, and macro suicide risk and protective factors that impact suicidal behaviors, uh, whether it's suicide, suicide attempts, suicide ideation, and deliberate self-harm. We're going to sort of run through, this is probably one of the more important slides we're going to discuss. This ecological model of ideology um, uh, really suggests in turn that, that our suicide prevention efforts themselves should come in sort of three flavors, that the micro, meso, and macro level being the individual, the institutional, uh, as well as the community uh, types of interventions. We think about primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention uh, across the life course. The next slide talks just, just to the fact of these various micro level risk factors. And importantly, I want to talk just for a second about genetic vulnerabilities. There's a, a sort of almost a certain ennui or almost fatalism among many, uh, even healthcare providers. Uh, in New Zealand and elsewhere that uh, a lot of suicidal behavior is genetically pre-programmed and there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, unfortunately, th there, there is some data that, per that certainly says genetics uh, probably affects about 50% of all human behavior, no question. But there's another 50% that we certainly can leverage to prevent uh, suicide, uh, depression, substance abuse, independence, and other risk factors uh, for self-harm. Another psychiatric, uh, another, another micro-level risk factor is psychiatric illness. Uh, as we, Annette mentioned, depression, certainly substance abuse, uh, other data promoting other kinds of mood disorders as well, uh, and PTSD, et cetera, can also predispose to, to suicidal behavior. Uh, at the other level, in many studies, uh, uh, studies of males especially show that there are often more violent means of suicide attempt and completion. Often these are contingent on impulsivity and aggression. Uh, certainly, um, this timer is done. It's the timer. Sorry, excuse me. It's just the timer. Um, other micro-level risk factors would include hopelessness, uh, previous suicide attempts, poor coping skills, physical illness and injury, I mentioned PTS, post-traumatic stress disorder, and as well as things like traumatic brain injury. We've seen among many athletes, both in New Zealand and other countries, uh, they're often at risk for uh, mood disorders and depression, as well as suicide. 
Uh, sexual orientation is another uh, risk factor at the micro level. And then these in turn, these sort of risk factors then inform these individual level prevention strategies highlighted on the next slide. Certainly individual interventions that can help include uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, certain kinds of psychotherapy, certain medications that address mood disorders can be very effective, uh, psychosocial support, lifestyle changes, certainly diet and exercise uh, are preventive strategies, uh, improve coping skills, uh, anger management and conflict resolution skills, uh, interventions that promote optimism and wellness behaviors, uh, as well as those interventions that control impulsivity and anger. Um, other micro-level intervention prevention strategies that have been tested include cyber uh, phone and text messaging interventions, uh, medication and appointment uh, reminders, as well as certain safety planning uh, uh, strategies. So some of the protective factors at the micro level need to be thought of sort of in the uh, next slide uh, or on the next slide or, or really contingent on the time course or where the particular individual is. Certainly if, they're, if safety is a major and imminent concern, uh, acute distress or crisis management uh, strategies need to be deployed. Obviously engagement with health services, whether that be in the local emergency department or psych emergency services or crisis teams, uh, calling helplines such as the free, free number of 0800-543-354. Uh, obviously for immediate danger, uh, individuals should be encouraged to call 111. Um, obviously more preventive aspects of taking medications, following up prescribed treatments, keeping appointments. Uh, can also uh, mitigate acute crisis. Other protective factors at the psychological level uh, on the next slide um, show uh, really from our, a host of research showing that people exposed to difficult life experiences generally don't have suicide risk and obviously there are other protective factors that can be developed such as resilience or mental hardiness, uh, ability to cope with uh, adversities. This can also be fostered by a sense of individualized self-worth, self-efficacy, learning effective coping and problem-solving skills, uh, focusing on others and serving others and volunteerism, uh, learning to learning help-seeking behaviors, and other activities that promote satisfaction with life as well as uh, having a positive therapeutic relationship with a therapist or a physician. Other micro-level protective factors in the health sphere certainly include other daily well-being promotion, obviously mentioned diet and exercise, sometimes keeping a gratitude journal uh, or a hope box, a hope box being, this is shown on the next slide, uh, a collection of perhaps photos or uh, pictures or, uh, or perhaps uh, trinkets or, or memories or poems or, or th prayers or things that will help people cope in an acute situation um, or phone numbers to call or p friends to talk to. Um, Obviously, uh, I mentioned volunteer activities as well as a focus on helping others. Uh, we've been looking at even things like pet therapy and having responsibility for, for pets uh, can promote a sense of wellness. Uh, improve social contact. Uh, social media can be a pro protective factor, although it can also be a risk factor. Uh, and also taking up hobbies, uh, again, increasing exercises and outside interests. Next slide, again, refers to the fact that uh, many people who, um, who die by suicide are often depressed, but they're not usually engaged in, in, in therapy. In many cases, they're not taking their antidepressants. Many patients actually uh, come into health care for other comorbid problems, and their depression is not diagnosed. Uh, in emergency department samples, we've determined that up to a third of our patients uh, here in New Zealand have major depressive disorder that, are, that is otherwise untreated. Uh, un unrecognized and, of course, um, not followed up. Many of our patients, unfortunately, probably fewer than half, take the medications as prescribed. And this results in confusing information in the literature as to the efficacy of these uh, medications. Among people that take them properly, uh, their impact uh, their protective, uh, in a protective sense seems fairly clear, at least for moderate depression. It's been <clears throat> there are certainly um, effective therapies as well. But many patients are not adherent or are able to comply uh, with those uh, sessions. Sometimes they're, they don't have adequate support uh, to attend, and frequently they're lost to follow-up. 
um, educating primary care physicians to assess, treat, and manage depressed and suicidal patients uh, is another possible protective strategy in the health sector, uh, as well as in emergency departments where many of the high-risk patients uh, present, uh, to encourage help-seeking adherence and treatments with medications through the use of technology is another way to protect individuals. We mentioned social, social connectedness, and then the next slide, uh, social support from other people. Uh, studies have shown, again, that uh, marriage seems to be a protective factor, as uh, are uh, religious and spiritual practices. Going back again to the model, so that was sort of the micro-level uh, risk factors and micro-level interventions that was shown in white on the next slide for revisiting our ecological model. Now we're going to go into the meso-level or the middle-level uh, risk factors and interventions and the sort of institutional, uh, legal, financial, uh, disciplinary problems, uh, certainly risk factors. Uh, family violence is a big risk factor, as, as this audience probably is aware. Uh, parental psychopathology is a risk factor, as is unemployment, social isolation, academic stress and pressures among students. Uh, institutional settings have particular risks, certainly prisons, uh, other uh, school uh, situations, as well as uh, health services. Um, there are clusters and issues around contagion uh, within different settings as well uh, that pose risks. And the next slide, again, highlights some of the institutional strategies that might be used uh, at the meso level to, uh, to prevent suicidal behavior include education, screening, skills building, uh, gatekeeper support and recognition, uh, workplace uh, health promotion and wellness programs, um, psychosocial interventions such as anti-bullying campaigns, uh, partner violence screening, parent and family support, uh, crisis hotlines and social support among institutions, institutional settings can be helpful, as can uh, health care screening, assessment, and education. Um, cluster, for cluster recognition and management, uh, postvention and bereavement support and workplace support can all be helpful at the meso level. So that was sort of the middle or institutional uh, level. Uh, finally, we're going to talk about the macro level risk factors or society-wide risk factors include certain laws and policies such as drug and alcohol access. Unfortunately, last week, I guess it was, we lost an opportunity to promote a uh, more conservative alcohol access policy among our youth. Uh, that was a lost opportunity that would impact suicide prevention uh, in the positive sense. Uh, I think we need to, as advocates and researchers, we need to try to inform uh, these policymakers uh, in the future as their uh, <laughs> as their uh, legislation makes a big impact on, on the macro level risk factors. There are obviously uh, environmental factors as well, such as seasons, weathers, uh, seasonal affective disorder, uh, disasters more in the long term. And the short term disasters actually, in some sense, prevent uh, self harm behavior. People are tuned into survival mode, and uh, it's over the longer term um, that we're, we see, for example, in Christchurch, uh, people are trying to build, rebuild their lives. Uh, they have lost businesses, lost income, lost homes. Uh, these people are at risk. Um, another important uh, risk factor is media over-reporting. I think we've try we're trying hard to be helpful to the media to get the right messages out at the right time, in the right place, in the right form, but sometimes there is a, a bit of a dramatization or glorification of suicide, both uh, in television media as well as in cyberspace. Uh, cyber exposure is bullying or similar threats at the macro level. And then also as society is becoming more individualistic, more materialistic, we're seeing the Fanao families uh, disintegrate, people move here from other countries, there's uh, less connection to their families of origin or their homeland, uh, certainly from the islands and other parts of the world. Uh, we're seeing increased immigration in many areas, but uh, lots of dis social disintegration puts society at a, at a risk. Um, Macroeconomic restructuring and globalization are forces that also increase the uh, risk of, of self-harm, as are uh, other uh, cultural differences. Um, mac at the, the next slide will just briefly highlight some of the macro-level strategies that might be uh, discussed uh, in order to enhance uh, the protection, the health and welfare of society. Community, state, national policy interventions includes means restrictions uh, precipitated by a mass uh, murder uh, a few years ago. We have tighter gun policy now in New Zealand. 
Uh, I mentioned the drug and alcohol policies uh, that opportunities were recently missed. I think hopefully we'll revisit some of those and hopefully uh, get uh, help policymakers make uh, better choices going forward. Uh, media guidelines and how suicide should be reported uh, or when it should be reported. Uh, certain um, opinions uh, of those in the media who feel like the more we talk about it, the better uh, are somewhat misinformed, unfortunately, and I think uh, that needs to be uh, highlighted as well. Um, it's, there, there's certainly differences between talking about wellness and promoting wellness and treatment for depression and risk factors, but sort of focusing on uh, suicide at times, at times can, can make it uh, more appealing f uh, as a choice for, for certain persons who are ambivalent. Um, certainly health and wealth, wellness promotion strategies at a social level, you know, uh, perhaps as uh, you know, government support for people to be able to, to enroll in an exercise program, better diet um, control, social policies and, and increased employment um, opportunities can also be preventive strategies. Improving health literacy, destigmatizing mental health problems, uh, especially leveraging our famous athletes and rugby teams, for example, to help destigmatize depression is an important strategy. And using that in public service announcements uh, and messages, both in the television and cyber media, can be helpful. Uh, means restriction is, is one thing I wanted to highlight. I mentioned uh, the, the gun control issue, uh, which was a positive step forward. Um, but you know, certainly the alcohol issue, so we must remember suicidal behavior on the next slide, is, is often contemplated when someone is intoxicated with drugs or alcohol. And if we restrict access to means, we can certainly impact how many people uh, self-harm. So it's a very effective, important strategy. And has been actually shown uh, for domestic gas, for carbon monoxide, uh, metro railway systems, uh, guns, bridges, jumping sites, medication, uh, blister packs, uh, may all be have impacted uh, suicide rates. The next slide is a, highlights some work by my colleague here, Dr. Botre, where the actually investigated here in Auckland the uh, barriers on the Grafton Bridge. Uh, there were safety barriers in place uh, on the Grafton Bridge, and then they were removed um, in the last decade, which lead, led to a five, almost six-fold increase in suicide attempts or suicides from the bridge, which prior to removal, there were only three suicides in four years, and then there were 19 suicides in the five years after the barriers were removal, removed. And then once those barriers were then reinstated, we saw you know, a back to normal, uh, almost zero, uh, zero suicides from the bridge in the last decade, as shown in the next slide, suicides at Grafton Bridge. That's a small example, but uh, that intervention, that data did inform policy and has certainly impacted uh, the suicide rate uh, in Auckland. Um, certainly, uh, so the theme for this next slide talks about the strengthening protective factors and instilling hope, uh, winning ways to well-being. Uh, we want to thank our sponsor uh, and want to remind you to all give your time connect, take notice, keep learning, and be active. Uh, I think there's a lot we can do going forward. Introducing these simple strategies into daily life uh, can help us reap the benefits for mental health and well-being. Um, we certainly now have a sufficient body of evidence and data about risk and protective factors for suicide. Um, contrary to some public opinion, the medical model can work. Uh, it can be effective, but it has to be empowered to be effective. Uh, patients have to adhere. Patients have to enter partnerships uh, with, their, with their physicians and therapists uh, and realize that it's a team effort sometimes in, in working towards uh, cure. And it's unfortunate that at times, because of some failures, people have sort of thrown the baby out with the bathwater and abandoned uh, the medical model. Um, I think it's important now to take the evidence we have and turn it into effective programs. We do need additional investment uh, to train healthcare workers and people in different workplaces as part of our prevention work workforce. We do expand the funding for more uh, research on interventions that work, uh, and we need to uh, change attitudes that are stuck in the inertia of the past uh, and in sort of a sense of hopelessness that things uh, can't be improved. So 
There's no, um, uh, there is at the end of this month, we're hosting a suicide prevention conference that's highlighted on the next slide. Um, it's called Ideas, Innovation, and Implementation. It'll be at the Ellerslie Events Center here in Auckland on Friday, 28 September 2012. And you can get more information about that conference uh, by going on www.suicideprevention2012.weebly.com. And we'll be having Sir Peter Gluckman and visiting Professor Eric Kane and uh, Paul Kelly from Ireland um, and a host of other uh, excellent uh, speakers, Professor Jane Perkis from Australia, David Ferguson down from Christchurch, as well as many other um, people who are leaders, thought leaders in this field uh, at this conference. And this will discuss uh, everything from suicide as a public health problem, uh, Maori and, and suicide prevention among uh, Pacific Islanders and other uh, immigrant peoples, as well as uh, suicide clusters. and. Uh, uh, and, and the emergency department has a site for suicide prevention, pathways to suicide, and public and private partnerships uh, for suicide prevention, as well as e-health and IT interventions for suicide prevention. Um, so again, that website is www.suicideprevention2012.weebly.com, and that's from 8.30 to 5 p.m. 20th of September. And uh, I think now we can uh, entertain some, some of your questions. Okay, thanks, Luke. We've had a number of questions come through by email and on Twitter. Just as a reminder, if you have anything to ask um, on Twitter, use hash, hashtag WSPDNZ, World Suicide Prevention Day New Zealand, and, or, or email through to moira at mentalhealth.org.nz. Um, just having a look through the questions that we've, we've had come through. Um, one is looking at social media. Look, you mentioned um, that social media could be either a, a risk or a protective factor, and um, somebody was interested in the idea of social media as a protective factor. And what what could that look and feel like? Well, certainly, social connections that are positive can be a preventive uh, for suicide behavior. The sort of the emergence of Facebook and and other social media have, have allowed certainly young folks to connect more, more than ever before. On the other hand, some studies now suggest the more people are on Facebook or on Twitter, probably the more socially connected they really need to be. And it may be, in fact, be a sign that they're, they are in need of other kinds of social support. So like anything, too much uh, might be a risk factor and too little might suggest that you're not uh, able to get enough social support. Um, so, so cyberbullying is also a risk factor that can occur on social media, so there's certain risk inherent with that. Uh, if someone defriends you on Facebook, it can seem you know, a heartbreaking uh, event. Perhaps it was an unintended uh, deletion, but these kinds of things matter a lot to young, young folks especially uh, who spend a good deal of time on, on social media. On the other hand, uh, there is a, uh, a blogosphere someone recently told me about where uh, a lady who um, uh, has a, her own online blog, uh, got uh, a recent submission from someone who was very depressed and thinking of suicide. And just after that was posted, um, dozens and dozens of other bloggers logged on to try to help her and support her and try to provide her with support and solutions that were quite effective, actually, sort of gang tackling the individual. So, so there are opportunities to use social media to actually uh, prevent uh, suicide behavior as well. Fantastic. Um, looking through the questions, uh, when you have somebody in your family who's made a suicide attempt, um, you know that they have an increased risk for suicide and you were talking about the, um, the risk factors around individuals. What would your advice be to families in this situation? Thank you. Um, uh, it depends on uh, the type of uh, and the severity of the suicide attempt that the person had made, has made and uh, the time period from the suicide attempt. Uh, but the sorts of things that a family can do to support um, a, a family member who's made a suicide attempt are um, most definitely to support them to um, adhere with their medication and their treatment regime and to um, support them in provide uh, social support, uh, to be aware of the need to remove access to means of suicide if the person 
um, is uh, in fact suicidal. Um, uh, th those are the sorts of things that can be done. Do you want to add to that? Well, so, so it depends if the person's in crisis and certain interventions that need to be considered if the person is in imminent risk or if the risk is more protracted. So in the latter case, and certainly improving, as Annette said, uh, adherence with medications, perhaps with therapy, getting them engaged uh, in their own treatment, uh, thinking about, in addition, we mentioned wellness prevention strategies, uh, exercise, diet, all these things that you've heard before are actually quite important. Um, and then also uh, helping the individual have a safety plan. It may include a hope box. It may include uh, certain phone numbers they use or call when they're in crisis, maybe a therapist, maybe a crisis team, maybe the crisis hotline, it may be 111, but they need sort of a strategy to deploy and help define that, walk them through that, give them reminders, provide them with the kind of support they need, uh, you know, check in with them, uh, see how they're doing. Clearly, uh, the risk is a, is a moving target. It's not static, and it can be changed, obviously, by environmental circumstances, uh, helping them to help control their environment uh, by being proactive uh, can be a very effective uh, strategy to, to care for the ones you love. Okay, great. I had a few questions about um, Indigenous suicide prevention, particularly around Māori in New Zealand. Māori rates are still, still high. Do you think that current strategies are appropriate? And is there anything you can comment on around suicide prevention for Indigenous community? This is a difficult one being new to the country, I imagine. Well, again, I, I have to say, being new to the country and living downtown, where I see every weekend uh, walking over the, the bodies of young people vomiting on the streets, <laughs> I have to say that, that we have to think about alcohol exposure and drug exposure, especially among the young folks. I, I think uh, we see all this in, in North America as well, the tension of among indigenous people of the highest suicide rates in, in North America. Uh, again, they're, they're stuck sort of between the traditional models of strong family ties, a proud tradition and heritage, and then this sort of postmodern world where uh, all these other opportunities are availed them and they might feel a bit left out of some of these things and, and they're uh, sort of playing catch up in many areas. Um, it's, it's quite challenging. They're, they're straddling two different cultures, two different histories, two different worlds, two different languages. Um, they're not sure how they fit in, and, and I think we have to do things that are proactive to, to make them feel uh, empowered, respected, uh, dignified, and not uh, uh, so vulnerable. I think that um, including cultural assessment and cultural models of treatment um, are appropriate uh, approaches as well. Great. Thank you. Um, somebody was asking, are there, what are effective examples of education and um, education programs in schools that you've come across in your work? Or what are some examples of things that schools can implement? Um, I think because of the focus on youth suicide, there's been always a great deal of interest um, and in fact um, an intuitive appeal in placing suicide prevention programs in schools because the argument is, is that's where all young people are and if you have uh, some program which can effectively inoculate them against suicidal behavior both during their teenage years and as they get older um, th that, that would be the ideal suicide prevention program unfortunately it doesn't exist and there were a number of dangers um, highlighted with the first um, raft of school suicide prevention programs which were essentially didactic and uh, informed young people about suicidal behavior and it was found out that when these programs were actually rigorously evaluated they had a number of inherent dangers and this shouldn't surprise us because we actually see this with other social issues that we discuss with young people if you talk to them about use of drugs their drug increase actually increases um, even though the aim of the program was to decrease drug use. If you talk to them about um, sex education, um, uh, experimenting with sex increases. If you talk to them similarly about suicide, then uh, it becomes an attractive option and there is the risk of normalizing suicidal behavior for some young people. So 
that has effectively been uh, discarded as an approach to as school suicide prevention programs. And the next generation of school prevention programs has really focused on skills building. So things such as um, um, improving conflict resolution, anger, anger management, um, all those things that are going to equip people, conflict resolution, are going to equip equip young people to deal um, with problems um, when they're teenagers and uh, equip them with skills which will uh, help them when they're older um, is, is a very good way to go that isn't going to have any risks. The other approach is to do screening for suicide um, risk in schools but that and, and then to refer those who screen positive on to mental health services for uh, uh, more in-depth evaluation and then for treatment to be uh, implemented as necessary. That, that has problems because um, it does consume school time and because suicide risk um, fulminates and changes and if you assess someone uh, and screen them for risk at a particular time um, that risk may, uh, may not be present but it may be present at a later time. So there are problems with that. Um, the, there, there have been a very large number of programs implemented in schools. Most of them have not been evaluated. Though of those that have been evaluated, many of them have had problems. So the current view is that the safest way to go is uh, in terms of skills building. And there are some examples, such as the program Zippy's Friends, which was in fact developed in the UK and is now disseminated widely around the world, where they're actually starting with children as young as six years old in terms of trying to improve their coping strategies and um, socialization skills. Yeah. Great. Probably, probably linked to that, I guess, thinking about the theme of, um, of strengthening protective factors. What can young people do to help keep their friends safe without perhaps directly addressing the topic of suicide, but around strengthening uh, well-being and protective factors? I think encouraging friends to seek help is one of the most important things that young people can do. Um, and again, the fact that young people tend to talk to other young people and maybe divulge to their peers their suicidal behaviour or uh, their depressive moods um, has led people to suggest that we train young people to be peer helpers. I think we have to be very careful about this approach because um, it can put a, a very um, burdensome weight on young people and in fact on young people's families um, to expect them to shoulder the problems of their friends. Um, if we are going to um, encourage peer support, we need to choose and select very carefully the peer leaders that we identify. Um, I think that more generally, um, encouraging young people to seek help from older people and to offer to broker assistance and help for their peers who uh, may be feeling suicidal is the safest way to go. Uh, the mo one of the most important messages to get across is that it's not okay to keep secrets um, uh, amongst young people about suicide and the best thing you can do for friends is to uh, seek help. And along those lines, actually modelling to young people um, how to ask a friend um, if they're suicidal and how to offer to help them is uh, sometimes a very useful approach. Okay, that possibly ties into the next question around um, gatekeeper training. Somebody was asking whether the assist gatekeeper training is implemented in New Zealand. Um, so that's, so yes, um, both the assist and QPR gatekeeper training um, programs are available here. Um, the second part of the question was, do you think that it's feasible to implement within um, church and village communities in New Zealand, particularly, I guess, around Pacific youth suicide? But um, do you think, I guess, do you think that gatekeeper training is a helpful approach? So this is, this is sort of training key individuals to be able to recognise uh, people who might be at risk of suicide and refer them to help. 
yes, uh, I think one of the values of uh, gatekeeper yeah. education is that it does educate um, leading people in the community um, and people who have roles within the community. Um, uh, it can educate people about suicide and there's um, certainly a need to provide people with factual information about suicide and about how to best seek help and where the res what the resources are. Um, so certainly it would be um, a, a, a very advantageous if we were able to implement some type of gatekeeper program, and there are a large number of them, um, but ones that have been evaluated and shown to be effective um, uh, in as many faith-based communities and villages as possible. And this really uh, is covered in many national suicide prevention strategies around the world where there is a community investment um, in educating gatekeepers. Uh, the, the research that has been done on this is quite interesting and in it suggests that not everyone is ideally suited in terms of personality and interest and aptitude to be a gatekeeper. So uh, the research that ha has, uh, ha has been conducted suggests that um, after gatekeeper training, the people who did best in terms of educating other people and asking questions about suicide were those who were already doing it anyway. Uh, but certainly there's uh, room for educating the community in that way. Great. We had quite a few questions come through about media reporting, um, various different questions around the evidence um, to do with restrictive media reporting, whether we want to be talking more about suicide in the media or, or less. And um, one of the questions was quite long, and I might just read this through because I think this captures some of the other questions that have come through. That um, somebody says, I've been aware of two schools of thought in terms of open and frank discussion about suicide. For example, the recent TV campaign to talk about to talk more about suicide that was aired on Māori TV and um, QPR training offered widely to community agencies, or on the other hand, exercising caution about open discussion in favour of a focus on the underlying factors such as depression or drug abuse. So where do we stand now as a country about either open discussion and unfettered media reporting or caution about instilling suicidal ideation and controls on media reporting? Is there a consensus about how to alert people to the risk of suicide and how to prevent contagion following a completed suicide? There's quite a few issues in that question. But well, I would only say briefly there is a consensus among educated researchers who know <laughs> better than the people we're evaluating, in this case the media. Uh, the media have a conflict of interest uh, for them to actually address this issue head on and say, well, this suggests we should be a little more careful. The evidence says X, but we think Y, and we're just going to do Y anyway, because <laughs> that's what we want. That, that promotes our agenda, and our agenda is to get more viewers, increase our rating. It's a different goal. Our goal as researchers and advocates is to prevent suicide and look at ways to do that. The evidence is overwhelmingly clear. The media's refusal to acknowledge that in many cases, not all cases, but in many cases, is obviously understandable. They have a conflict of interest, and I think that's something that uh, needs to be worked out going forward. Uh, there are media guidelines. Uh, certainly Dr. Botre has been very uh, involved in that, and uh, other researchers around the world have looked at this and developed consensus guidelines. Brent, do you want to add to that? I think it is important to recognise that there have now been um, very many studies conducted, um, at least 80 uh, studies of the media impact of, on subsequent suicide, media reporting of suicide on subsequent suicide. These studies have been conducted in a range of different countries around the world, um, different cultures, different types of media. Um, uh, the uh, outcomes have been both suicide attempts and suicides. The are, as uh, Luke suggests, overwhelmingly consistent and show that under certain circumstances, um, incautious suicide reporting um, can result in increased suicide. The people who are most vulnerable to media uh, uh, glorification um, and presentation, uh, incautious presentation of suicide are young people and people with depression who are the most vulnerable 
uh, people in our society. And I think it's a measure of our concern for the most vulnerable people that we are prepared to have some guidelines which um, protect them from this outcome. The situation in New Zealand currently is that the media have written their own guidelines um, and they summarise the evidence in just one sentence. Um, and that, uh, and, and they tend to have hedged it with a number of statements such as under some circumstances and uh, reporting may. It would lead a new or naive reporter to believe that there's very little risk associated um, with the media presentation of suicide. And that is simply not the case. The fact is that the evidence is so overwhelming that all the national suicide and international suicide prevention organisations such as the International Association in conjunction with the World Health Organisation have media reporting guidelines. Um, every country that has developed a national suicide prevention strategy has as part of that strategy one plank which is uh, cautious reporting around media. And the situation that we've arrived at in New Zealand, I think, and the questioner asks, where are we at? Uh, my fear is that we have now set New Zealand upon a path which diverges from best international practice in terms of media reporting. And we now need to put in place um, a rigorous evaluation to see what the outcome of our current uh, media strategy is going to be. I'll just say one final thing, that the media reporting evidence um, has led to media guidelines becoming one of the most popular suicide prevention strategies and public health messages about suicide that we actually have in the field. I, I want to follow that up, and, I mean, because the media has tremendous opportunity and power to be a force for good in this, and this is a whole message of hopefulness and positive messages of health, uh, you know, I mean, some of the very much simple public health things we've discussed around, you know, diet, exercise, prevention, and uh, wellness promotion uh, issues around, you know, following up with your doctor, et cetera. Uh, these are really important areas where the media can be a great friend and ally to, to all the, the general public and the public health. Um, so I want to be clear, the media has a great opportunity here to, to be uh, allies and advocates that, that can do a lot of good. And uh, unfortunately, I think sometimes um, the opportunities for um, getting something out there in the press uh, in its, uh, for its own sake uh, is, is uh, sometimes a mixed priority. And I think we do have to be careful and, and understand that some messages, however unintended, can be harmful. Okay. I think you've covered one of the follow-up questions, which was how can we use media for prevention, that there are some ways that media um, can, can be involved in the prevention effort. Um, another another follow-up question that came through was, was how well or not do you think New Zealand media is handling suicide? I know there was some research indicating that, they, that media, at least in 2010, was following guidelines reasonably well. Has, has there been any follow-up to that? that you're aware of? Uh, well, since 2010, uh, we have had these new guidelines where the Ministry of Health guidelines, which were actually the model for many of the international guidelines that have been developed um, in, in the last decade, were discarded and replaced with the media's uh, own guidelines. Um, and the media promised at that point that they would police their own guidelines. So we wait to see what they will do about that. Um, however, in fact, what we have seen is in a, a more open um, or an advocacy for more open discussion of suicide. And my concern is that it's a very unstructured and it's just a single response. People say we need to talk more about suicide and there is no evidence whatsoever that just talking about suicide um, is as a major social issue is actually going to help in terms of suicide prevention. As Luke suggested, the media can be most helpful if they discard suicide-specific discussions and focus on um, advocating uh, healthy practices, um, well-being, uh, optimism, um, diet and exercise, and those sorts of things. That 
isn't going to be as appealing to media, but that is the role that they could most helpfully play. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for that. Um, switching tack a little bit, um, we know that most completed suicides in New Zealand are of that sort of middle-aged men um, demographic. And there was a question regarding um, whether, there, whether, we think, whether you think there's any contribution um, in that statistic from um, discrimination that men face from groups like the Family Court and whether there's a role that perhaps the Family Court could play in, in preventing suicide. Um, I think there's no doubt that uh, men in, uh, in the family, in, who are for various reasons in, at the family court, um, are a very vulnerable population. And we did, did some research in uh, Christchurch some years ago which showed that uh, men uh, were in contact with the family court were 11 times more likely to make a suicide attempt or die by suicide than men who did not have such contact. Um, that, that's a remarkably um, elevated risk and although we have not done anything with uh, that research, research in New Zealand, in other countries such as Australia for example, they have uh, implemented screening programs for all men and uh, women who are in contact with the family court because they recognise that, particularly for men, the family court is a site um, for recognising uh, people who are at risk of suicide, for assessing them and for brokering help for them. Okay. Thank you. Um, looking, I guess, more at, at, the, at the individual and um, factors that might help individuals, quite a broad question and perhaps a difficult one. How do we instill hope in someone that's suicidal? Thinking back to the, the theme of the day. Well, it depends, I think, on the individual, of course, but I think instilling hope. Uh, again, you got to look at where their risk uh, lie, lay and whether uh, you can uh, impact that um, in an acute situation where they're in a crisis. You've got to first make them safe. Then you've got to provide the kind of uh, support and contact with professionals who can, who can assist them through the, the crisis period. And that, again, may involve crisis hotlines or coming to the emergency department or uh, going into a therapist's office or a psychiatrist's office or getting help through their GP, et cetera. Uh, but once they're stabilized, they're certainly developing uh, hope is a long, can be a long-term process, um, but requiring them to, uh, to engage uh, in their own care uh, through uh, both um, wellness promotion activity, uh, certainly uh, helping them uh, avoid alcohol, avoid certain depressing, uh, depressant substances, certainly limiting their exposure to news media uh, and certain uh, messages in, in society that are, that are not hopeful, uh, and certainly uh, substituting uh, things that are more positive, uh, getting them to start exercising, getting them to start walking, getting them to start keeping a gratitude journal, getting them to maybe volunteer, uh, thinking about others, perhaps uh, working with pets at the shelter, uh, perhaps uh, working as a volunteer at a hospital, uh, perhaps getting them engaged uh, in some sort of employment if they don't have a job, uh, working with them to, to find other activity, not just as a distraction, but as an investment in a broader world view uh, where they're sort of taken out of their own individual uh, context uh, and sort of immersed in something new uh, that may stimulate their, uh, their hope and their thinking, uh, and hopefully through improved thinking, uh, improved feeling, improved action and uh, over time uh, uh, more healthy and, and uh, uh, life choices. Fantastic. Thank you. I think that's probably about time, so that might be a good place to wrap up. Did either of you have any other points or thoughts that you wanted to raise? I'd just like to say one final thing. Um, Luke's just talked about um, instilling hope in individuals. Mm -hmm. I think that it's very important that we instill hope in suicide prevention um, much more generically because I think uh, there's been a certain fatalism um, at, attached to the whole field that we act because, I mean, 30 years ago when I started working in this field, we didn't have a lot of information about risk and protective factors. We now have that, but it is a slow and difficult area in which to pilot programs, 
um, implement them, evaluate them, and then translate them into community programs or individual programs that um, we all know are effective in suicide prevention. So I think instilling hope that we can do something about this problem, but even if it takes some time, we're actually working on it. And I would invite people who are interested to come along to our conference and listen to some New Zealand examples, which are world breaking, um, groundbreaking, in terms of novel and innovative approaches to suicide prevention. Else to add, Luke? No, that's good. Okay, fantastic. Um, so this this presentation has been recorded and it will be available online within the next few days. I'll send an email out to those of you who've registered through our website, and um, we'll also send out more information about the conference that that Luke and Annette are holding in Auckland later on this month. So thank you all for your time. And thank you. Goodbye from Thanks. us.